Trojans back doors. These are programs we've learned to fear, but how do hackers actually gain access to your computer? One way to do it is to use a root kit. Joining us now is Greg Ho Hoagland, right? Hoagland. Hoagland is the co-author of Exploiting Software and root kit expert Jamie Butler. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thanks. So tell me, what exactly is a root kit for people at home that have no idea what you're talking about? Simple explanation, it's a backdoor in your system. Okay. But what makes it different than, say, just a Trojan program is that a root kit is specifically designed typically to go into the kernel, hide inside the computer at the lowest level possible in the computer. So which makes it very difficult to remove, very difficult to detect. I was going to say, we've had, I mean, we've see, all seen all the different backdoors that are out there, Netbus and all the other ones yep. that have been back warfers that have been released in the past, but those can be picked up through a standard virus scanner, whereas something like a rootkit would be able to hide itself. Yeah, a rootkit would be able to hide itself. A rootkit could be used in conjunction with something like back mm -hmm. or Netbus to hide that program as well. Cool. So show me an example of a rootkit running. You actually created one for the screensavers. Yes, we have a Tech TV rootkit. <laughs> all right. We don't want to let this one get out in the wild. Yeah, so what we've got here, um, I've started up, I've made a copy of uh, your notepad.exe, just a normal program. But we're going to pretend like it's an evil program that we want to hide. So we've so got notepad. Yeah, said. notepad. Okay. So on the, sc on the screenshot here, we see tech evil notepad. So it's the evil version of notepad. Okay. What I'm going to do is go ahead and show this in the process list. It's running. It's right at the top there. Very top process. Tech right. evil note is running right there. Yeah. Okay. So that would be something we access via like control delete. The kernel is going to report exactly what applications are running on the Absolutely. machine. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. And this could be your netbus or your back warfare right. or whatever. Now I'm going to go ahead and start up the tech TV rootkit. Uh, just tap the button over here, and we see it just disappeared. The process disappeared. Right. So now you didn't kill the process. Not at all. It's still running in the background, but hidden to where the kernel can't even detect that it's running. Well, the kernel knows that it's running because it's running the processes. But what the kernel isn't doing is telling anybody else that it's running. I see. So how is it doing this? What is you explained something earlier called hooks? What is that exactly? Yeah, call hooks. Um, this is a technique used by rootkits. Um, it's an older technique. Uh, Jamie's come up with some more elite techniques, which she's going to show you in a minute. Um, a call hook, the way it works is uh, the kernel's going to ask, answer some questions. Mm -hmm. And any application on the computer can ask this question. But what the hook does is it redirects the question to somewhere else to be answered. It can, I the, see. The, the root kit answers the question instead of the normal part of it. Yeah, the we call. actually have an animation of that here, so of the, uh, of the hooked function call. So a normal function call, here's a normal function call, as you're explaining. So we have a normal program, it's running. It queries a table of function addresses. Mm -hmm. From that table, it's then able to branch to the appropriate place, and the function answers the question. All is good. Now, on a hooked function call, the, kernel will go, or the kernel's running, and the rootkit goes in and modifies this function table and redirects that question to be answered by somebody else, the rootkit. I kit. see. Oh, it's redirecting it all around. OK. Yes. So now, these, uh, these have been around for a while. Hooks, uh, they're pretty basic. What about the more advanced methods? Well, well the more advanced method is uh, where you modify the kernel data itself. So when the kernel's queried for the processes or the users and so forth, it looks through memory in these data structures. An advanced rootkit could actually modify the data itself instead of the call. I see. So let's take a look at a normal kernel and how it would operate. We have uh, another animation of that. Here's, explain to me what's going on here. This is the uh, operating system going out to its data structures and, for instance, returning a list of processes. OK. Just like we showed here. Yeah, exactly. And it does it just fine, no problems whatsoever. Yeah, but there's no you... hooks in place, no redirection. But then when there's a modified kernel, What's going to happen? Well, the data is going to be uh, manipulated in such a way that the kernel won't see it anymore. So the data itself has changed. Not the code of the kernel, just its data. So is it poisoning the, I, I see the, 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 the graphic we just had, is it poisoning the, the memory? Yes, yes, absolutely. OK. So I, how, how it's different from a, from a call hook is that the same code is running. No code is modified. Just the data that that code is using to answer the question has been poisoned. I see. So now, w couldn't there be like, couldn't you run like an MD5 check on the kernel's size to see if anything has changed? Sure. And wouldn't that be a s sufficient protection against it, or a way to protect against these types of attacks? Well, one of the very interesting things about a kernel mode rootkit is that the kernel is the lowest level of the system, mm -hmm. and the rootkit is operating there. So you can always do things in the kernel, try to do integrity checks, see if there's, you know. Uh, illegal or malicious software running in the system, but any of those things that can be done 
are operating at the same level as the rootkit. Therefore, the rootkit could just modify those parts of the kernel. I see. It's okay. an even playing field at that point. Right, because they're all on the same level. Correct. So tell me, what, how are people going to get affected with this? Is this something people should worry about? Is this an attachment they would open? or? Well, very important to realize, a rootkit in and of itself is not an exploit against the computer. A rootkit is what an attacker puts on a computer once they've already run an exploit. I see. And they're going to gain control yeah. of the computer. When, and it's only when they want to come back for more later. Right. If you just want to break in, steal something and leave, there's no sense in leaving a rootkit behind. Okay. Cool. Now, you have actually created an application uh, that can detect these rootkits in Windows. That's correct. Uh, what's it called? It's called uh, Vice. Uh, it detects kernel mode and user mode hooks. Can we show an example? Do you have Vice running here? Can you show sure. me yeah. uh, it, that it, how it detects the... Uh, so you, you still have that service running? Or? I'm going to go ahead and stop the Tech TV, Tech TV rootkit. Okay. And uh, you can see, actually, the Tech Evil Notepad came back real quick. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back over here. You can see that the uh, rootkit is living on the C drive right here. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to go ahead and start the rootkit again. Okay, it's and started. I'm going to refresh right. this view. And you can see that those rootkit files are now hidden. Right. We don't see them anymore. Now I'm going to go over to Vice. And I'm going to hit Scan. Vice runs. And here we see. That was quick. Yeah, it's very fast. Jamie's code has gone out, analyzed the kernel, found the hooks that were in place. We actually see the name of the function that was hooked. And better yet, we actually see the file that's doing the I hooking. See even though we can no longer see the file when we look at the file system. Okay, so, I mean, it's, it's obviously so much faster because it's not scanning files like a virus scanner would. Right. It just looks at, at the kernel and, and see if anything's been modified. Right. Correct. So now, how would someone delete this? Let's say they're infected and they find that they actually have a rootkit on their machine. Uh, how, what are they going to do? How are they going to go about removing that? If it's hiding itself, how can they remove it? The best way to do it is probably to mount it over a network drive or to... Uh, mount it over another file system, another OS. So boot up in a separate OS, then mount the drive okay. and go delete it. So you're saying take out the hard drive altogether, hook it up as a slave yes. on a friend's computer, right. and then read the file system, look for that specific file that it indicated here as a rootkit path on this on the device indicated, right. and delete it manually. Yes. Could even use one of your groovy USB uh, things you just showed off. Oh, the little USB yeah. external hard drive. Little forensic right container, exactly. plug it in. Oh, cool. Nice. So how many rootkits are there out there in the wild right now? Well, there's pro probably many rootkits that are not publicly mm -hmm. known about, but on the rootkit.com site, there are probably five or six. Now, that's for the Windows side of things. That's through the Windows side. How about uh, OS 10 users, Unix side of things? This is important to understand. Rootkits actually started with Unix. Right. So rootkits for Unix systems have been around a lot longer than Windows. But the science of rootkits, if you want to call it that, has been around for over 10 years. So there's plenty of rootkits available for all the platforms out there. Okay. So you have you actually have all the source code for all this on your website. Is it rootkit.com is your Root website? Yes, rootkit.com. Okay. So if people go to root uh, rootkit.com, they can download Vice, and it's completely free, freeware. Absolutely. Right. Cool. And it'll scan their system, and they'll know whether or not they have a rootkit installed. Yes, they will. Right. Excellent. It Thanks. doesn't detect all rootkits, though. We left one rootkit. On the site that it can't detect. Why, why did you do that? You're, you're providing a tool to help people. It, it could be. It could be. We just ran out of time. Yeah. Well, oh, okay. I was going to say, you know, we wanted to. Yeah. He gave it up. But there's going to be an update. You guys have an update. Yeah, we'll keep updating the tool, and it'll get better as time goes on. But the thing is, there's always going to be a back and forth with this. Right. Everything that Vice or we add to do uh, to detect a rootkit, somebody out there is going to say, oh, look, I got a way around that. Right. And then we'll see that and back and there's forth. There's no such thing as like real time discovery for this type of stuff. You have to identify it first, just yeah. like viruses You've almost. Know all the tricks. Know all the yeah, tricks, and then program the tr so that it can look for those tricks. Correct. Cool. Excellent. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate you showing us on the show. Head on over to screensavers.com. You can actually read some of Greg's book, Exploiting Software. Lots of information about rootkits in there, and actually a great book. A lot of my friends have told me it's a great read for the hardcore guys out there.